My name is Julie Pearson Little Thunder. Today is Friday, November 11th, 2011. I'm interviewing Anna Mitchell for the Oklahoma uh, Oral History Research Program at Oklahoma State University. We're in Venita at Anna's apartment. Anna, it's rare for an artist to actually be able to be pointed out as the very first person to do this or that but you really were the first Oklahoma artist to revive the Southeastern tribe's pottery tradition. And since then, you've won multiple awards and honors that have secured your place in the art world. Thank you for taking the time to speak with me. Where were you born and where did you grow up? Uh, I was born east of uh, Jay, Oklahoma, in a community called Sycamore. The name is still there, but there's not much there anymore. And I think it's just almost close to the Arkansas line. And uh, uh, I don't remember a whole lot about that because I was born there. I barely remember my grandfather lived close by. And the thing that I remember about that is uh, we had, of course, I was very small. Uh, um, my brother and I walked knee deep in snow up to my grandpa's. And uh, knee deep wasn't very much for two little kids. <laughs> so we went up there and uh, to visit him or he would come down and visit us. And uh, uh, that I barely remember that. I just remember how high the snow was and things fade out from there and pick up uh, later. When I was older, we moved uh, from the community area, not Sycamore, but the Piney area. Piney is still there. There was a community building and a church there, and they also had school for Indian kids. As a matter of fact, my sister went there. My oldest sister went to school when they had a country school there, and there would be a government car pick some of them up to go to school. And I remember uh, I didn't go because I would go down to the gate every day and wait for my sister to come home <laughs> from school. And I thought it was wonderful that she'd get in this nice fine car, <laughs> go off to school and she'd come out of this nice fine car. <laughs> And we were still uh, traveling around in wagons. <laughs> so anyway, that's what I remember about that. What did your... Uh, so we moved from that community to uh, Jay briefly, and then we moved south on Brush Creek, and that's where I grew up. I see. Did your dad uh, farm then? Pretty much, was that? Well, my mom and dad uh, didn't have a long marriage because I was a very small child, I understand. And she said I cried every night for my dad when he was gone. Mm -hmm. So they were divorced, and he later remarried uh, three times after that. So I have uh, half-sisters and brothers from his uh, second, third, and I guess just two times because uh, I still have brothers and sisters, half-brothers and sisters. And since I was sent off to Indian school when I was old enough, back in the 30s, uh, I, I was not as fluent in my language as I was when I went there. 
I couldn't speak uh, English at all when I went there. What school did you go to? Was it uh, all the Indian schools were set up to take our language and our heritage away from us? Mm -hmm. But I didn't know that. But they wouldn't allow us to speak. That was Seneca Indian School, okay. Wyandotte, Oklahoma. And uh, my mom used to come up and visit us there. She'd take the bus and it let her off at the foot of the hill and she'd walk on up. And for some reason, we'd be playing out somewhere and I'd look down and I knew it was my mother mm -hmm. because of the way she walked, you know. So <laughs> we'd run down and help her with whatever she had. But uh, I grew up at the Indian school and graduated uh, through the ninth grade. And uh, at that time, I was not fluent in Cherokee again. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, then I went to school at Haskell. But one summer, I came to Benito with my sister. She worked here, so I got a job that summer to work in a little hamburger joint. Were you in high a, school? Then? Yes, as a waitress. And uh, <laughs> so it was during wartime, and my husband was part Cherokee, and his family, his mother and dad's family, uh, and when they allotted land, uh, they were up in this part of the country. But his dad was born at uh, Oaks, Oklahoma. That's where his mother was from that area, his grandmother was from that area. She was the Cherokee, and uh, Mr. Mitchell was not. And, uh, but, uh, I met my husband during wartime. He was home on leave, and there was a lot of, a lot of soldiers around, but uh, he came over and talked to me because he thought I was Cherokee, and I was. He asked me if I could say this or that, and he'd try to write it down in his <laughs> little handbook, and uh, my sister also came, but she worked out at the state hospital. And we looked, looked like two peas in a pod. We were very close together in age. And our hair was uh, uh, styled a lot. It was back during the time they were wearing page boy with your hair turned under. And we just looked like two peas in a pod. So he asked her for a date one day, <laughs> thinking it was me. But he soon found out it wasn't. And, uh, so anyway, uh, I uh, went to shows with him. And a friend of his had a car. He'd drive in, we'd drag Maine. <laughs> go down <laughs> south on Main Street and listen to the first, uh, I guess, drive-in you ever saw. And it wasn't really like they are now. It was just a man who had a bunch of places where the girls would carry the food out to the car. And that was the first car hop <laughs> that we knew of. And They'd play real loud music, and we'd go down there and listen to the music. <laughs> and uh, of course, eventually, uh, after the war, uh, I was in high school at Haskell, and when he came home, I married him. Mm. So we had 50, I think it was 51 years of marriage. Mm when he passed away. Wonderful. And we had five children. And I outlived two of those children. 
My oldest child had cancer, fought it for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then my son had the heart problem that his dad and his uncles did on his dad's side. They, uh, some of them died young from heart problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, my son lived uh, close to us and uh, I saw him just go down. He was a strong, healthy looking guy and uh, his heart, they told us at the time of surgery, he might not live through the surgery. He did live through the surgery, but he had a very bad heart. And the doctor said, your body might be strong and want to do things, but your heart is not going to let you. You might live three years. He lived five, mm -hmm. but there weren't good years. Mm -hmm. He was very... He just kept going down. Mm -hmm. So, I outlived those two, and I have four daughters left. I have one that lives in Denver. Her name's Betty Gale. She married a doctor, and she's a, a pediatric practitioner. And uh, Julie went to OSU and graduated and married her husband. And I thought, as many times as we made trips there to see those, our girls, uh, I thought, well, this is the last trip. It wasn't. She married a guy from there. <laughs> <laughs> so she still lives over oh, close to still, okay. Stillwater. Okay. And she had uh, two boys and a girl and a boy. And the youngest boy is in his last year of college there. They all went to OSU except the girl. She wanted to be different. She went to Edmond. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my son went to OU. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to be like the girls. <laughs> When you were um, at Seneca Boarding School and also at Haskell, did you take any art classes? Were you uh, interested uh, in art at all? <clears throat> oh, well, you'd say they'd let us draw, you know, mm -hmm. but it wasn't called art. And then when we were at Haskell, I guess you could, but it was your choice. And I worked at the uh, school library where we put books together and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I was always busy over there and uh, knew what kind of books they had and years later ordered some for my information. Mm. So you weren't into sewing or any kind of three-dimensional Yes, we did have uh, sewing at Wyandotte, mm -hmm. and we had it, uh, they called it Home Ec, right. and we had it till we graduated. As a matter of fact, uh, we made our own uh, graduation dress, and uh, we went to uh, Joplin, Missouri with our teacher and picked out the material. Mm -hmm. So uh, we made our first pajamas and, and robe and things like that in that place. And in Haskell, it was your choice if you mm -hmm. wanted to sew or do some other thing. Mm -hmm. And I went into athletics, mm -hmm. and uh, I played basketball. It wasn't that great because we had a big girls basketball and a little girls basketball. We didn't get to go anywhere, the big girls did. Oh. <laughs> but sometimes we'd have to play uh -huh. with them. 
and get knocked down and all of that. <laughs> Gosh. So, well, you know, you have a quote um, about how you know you can't learn the culture without the art, or the art without the culture, and um, you know I don't think many people of the younger generation realize what a sea change there was in terms of you know um, you know this new attitudes towards the native arts and native cultures. Yeah. That began happening in the 60s and I wondered were you and your husband pretty active then around this uh, community? We were uh, always active in our neighborhood. The uh, Shawnees had their stock dances and their rituals but uh, they had all of that uh, the week of before they opened it up to the public for mm -hmm. Saturday dances, where people could come and, and join in the dances if they wanted to. But uh, we were very good friends to a Shawnee woman who was full blood and she had a lot of grandkids, but she lived next door to us and she always had to have somebody some relative take her out to set her up in her tent. A lot of times it was us because we lived next door. And it was very interesting what we learned about their culture because we'd go out the week before and see what they were doing. Right. And this was for their green corn or? Uh, they had their uh, uh, early, they had what they called a strawberry dance. Mm -hmm. Then they had their bread dance. Then they had their corn, uh, corn dance in the fall. And they also joined the Senecas over by the by Seneca in their dances. They could go back and forth, and and then they had uh, the Quapa. Uh, dances up near Miami. Right. So we went to a lot of these Indian things. So our kids grew up knowing these different things about other Indians. Did they also, did your kids also powwow dance at all? Or? Uh, yes, we went to powwows, but you know, it's strange. Cherokees had two kinds of Indians. One was the uh, ones who went to church, and the other was ones who followed the dances. And we were the ones that went to church, but we went to our church that preached in Cherokee, and you learned everything in Cherokee. They even uh, taught them how to read and write in Cherokee in church, it, so that they could read the Bible and understand that and what the preaching was about. And about the time that we were old enough to do that, we went to Wyandotte. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. only those that stayed home to go to school could go home every day and talk with their family. Right. And that's where we missed out, and uh, we didn't keep our language at that time. Now, when your um, children were young, were you a, a stay-at-home mom? Was your husband working and you were yes, staying with the kids? Uh, after the second child was uh, on the way, we decided there's no way I could pay a babysitter for one, much less two. So I began to be a stay-at-home mom all the rest of my life till my youngest child, my fifth child, was in the going into the third grade. So our older kids were getting ready to think about college. So I thought I better go to work. And when, when uh, my little girl came home from school, which 
It was just a block away to where we lived. Uh, her brother says, he came in right behind her and she was going through the house crying because she couldn't find mama. <laughs> I guess she forgot I went to work. <laughs> so uh, I worked all the way through until uh, I made all of their, for collars, their bat suits, I, I sewed for all of them. And I also sewed for other people, and I also altered clothes for other people. And that's what I did staying home. I see. Plus, we learned beadwork, and we do beadwork. So were you doing some, some sewing of um, tear dresses or anything like that, or just whatever people needed? just uh, whatever people needed and they'd come to me for like the children's Easter clothes mm. or the mother's Easter clothes. So I would take those early and then I'd take that money and buy our material and I was very late getting the last button on, on Easter. <laughs> <laughs> I bet they were beautiful. Well, um, I know you've told this story many times, but um, your journey towards pottery actually started with something quite different. Um, yes, uh, I was, remember I was 42 years old when we built our house out there in 1960-something, five or, we had the land two years before we built. And remind us where the your house was, where you built your house. I built, we built our house uh, probably a mile east and a mile, uh, uh, I guess, uh, five acres across. We we were on the other side of five acres behind there, on a. Uh, ten acre place. We bought the ten acre place. You know, all of the houses were built facing the highway, uh, and there was five acres between us and them. Uh, the highway, mm -hmm. and we were just, I'd say, a mile from, maybe a mile and a quarter from town and then south uh, across five acres and uh, we built the house I believe it was in 60 uh, probably 66 or 67. Mm -hmm. We've got it marked we made a little concrete thing to hold up a water fountain and under that on the fresh cement we put the year that our place was established <laughs> but two years before that we we went out every day and uh, we could and worked on it and that was in the Tahlequah area no or it was right out here oh, east of town east of Benita I've never been away from the Craig County. I mean, I've never lived away from Craig County since I married. Wow. Okay. So, and then um, <clears throat> you got uh, to digging out a pond, I guess. Uh, when I was forty-two, and we built our home, uh, we dug a pond on our place, thinking we have a couple of cattle and, and have uh, kind of fatten them and sell one and keep one. But that didn't happen, so uh, the pond was there and it was a dry summer in August and our kids played in this 10-foot hole 
And I went down there and I saw the clay. And I told my husband I was gonna, he'd always wanted a, what we called a sequoia pipe, a clay pipe with a cane stem. And we did have cane north of Vanita on Cabin Creek. So we'd go up there and get the stands and and when I first started doing the uh, pipes, I did about a dozen of them, laid them out. Next day went down there and they were all cracked. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what I did wrong or what the clay should have been. I just thought I could do it like uh, uh, plain mud pipes. <laughs> so I shaped them and then every time I saw somebody, didn't matter if they were doing wheel thrown art in clay, I would ask them questions about the clay. And I asked one man that was a uh, thrown uh, pots on a wheel, I s told him what was happening. And he said, well, what you're doing is drawing them too fast in the sun. And also your clay might not be just right. Mm. So I didn't know what right was. <laughs> so I had to weed through all of that to find the right information to even start the clay and eventually when I first got my little clay pipe my clay pipes and uh, I got about five of them through the fire I'll have to tell you the story about the first time I put ten of them in <laughs> my husband built a pit fire because they said that's how they fired them. Mm -hmm. how they fired the things. So I did dry them in the garage in a box, but I didn't realize that during the day the garage door was open, I mean during the night, and when the dew falls and the atmosphere turns, the clay just absorbs water like stone because mm. uh, I, I had studied that uh, clay is an erosion of stone over thousands of years and it depends on what kind of clay you have. Uh, so ours is a lot of earthenware clay but the clay we eventually used did have some Kaylin, I could fire it higher. But all those things I found out after a lot of work and I began to uh, grind my clay after it dried and on big uh, grinding stone I made, I'd sit on the edge of this big stone and there was a man out in western Oklahoma that had found real grinding stones that had been used mm -hmm. in his field. Mm -hmm. So he gave me two of them. Wow. And that's what I used all those years, wow. grinding the clay. And my husband would help me when he could. He'd always build my fires and then he'd have to go off to work and. A lot of times I'd be crying practically when all of my things burst in the fire. <laughs> and I was going back to the first time I fired about a dozen uh, pieces. I'd had them drying in the garage. Well, ev evidently they absorbed a uh, little moisture during. So I put them all around the uh, fire. He had uh, dug out a hole and around it, it was a ridge. So I just put my things all around it so they would get absorb some heat. Well, I thought they had enough heat. 
So I gradually scooted the coals back. Then I put all of them in the fire. Then I pulled the coals back over it. And I put some little sticks and things in it to start a slow fire. As soon as those pots, I had a couple of little pieces and, and those uh, uh, pipes got too hot. They start exploding like oh my firecrackers, <laughs> and oh, they were scary. popping out of there. So I ran away from the fire, <laughs> and, and, and I was just sick because they exploded. Oh. And so I had to weed all of that out. Oh. I, so I want to get clear, your. Um, you and your husband are kind of going to arts and craft shows from time to time or yes. whenever you have the chance and you see a potter, Indian or non-Indian, well, non-Indian, you're asking them, uh, you're telling them about this situation that you yes, have Yes, anybody home. that uh, has anything to do with clay, right. I would ask them questions and then I'd go back and try. Right. If I was doing this right, and because I had no idea what <laughs> right was, and uh, what made me stay in it, it's it's uh, it took so long. I just wondered what made me. I just had to prove to myself, if my people did it, why can't I do it? You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. and I just kept on with the clay vibes and. As a matter of fact, I think I have one of the, those pipes in one this. Pipes in there. In here. I'll, uh, I tell you what, we'll get it out at the end of the interview. How does okay. that sound? We'll take a picture of it. That would be and, great. <laughs> so, were you. Ex I know you went to North Carolina at some point. Did you successfully make a clay pipe prior to that? What. Uh, uh, at the time, uh, we had gone to North Carolina when the kids were very small. Then when I started this, I thought, well, they make pottery, so I'm going to go see them about this. And, um, but I was ahead of them. I had oh. already fired some pieces and had some pieces that were ahead of what they were doing. So they were also trying to revive that. Well, what they did, they had uh, the Caddo, uh, not Caddo's, but uh, there was another tribe. Catawba's, was it? Uh, Catawba's. Yeah. Had uh, met, lived with among them at one time. And they started uh, doing pottery like they did. And this is what they made. Uh, they knew about uh, old stuff, but they started doing this pottery that's small pieces for tourists mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they were having a very hard time after right. the removal. Right. They sold baskets and they sold pottery, and they would just pack it up and travel across the mountain to go sell it. So they stayed with the tourist stuff. And that's their, theirs was dark. And they wondered how I could get color. Mm -hmm. So I was a little ahead of them. But I still learned about the things when I'd go talk to a potter. Mm -hmm. I'd learn something, right? You know that would help me. Were you paying for this out of your own pocket, Anna? It was just you going on your own, or did the tribe? We just went on our own. Okay, uh, and your husband went, and your fam yes, family. Yes, husband and family, and uh, a lot of times it was a vacation trip, mm -hmm. and uh, we'd be gone uh, a week or two or 10 days, whatever, 
to make the trip there mm -hmm. back. And mm -hmm. what we did was we took enough money that we could stay there and come home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we didn't spend very much. And are we talking like the um, 60s at this point or? Uh, it was 50s. before then. The 50s. Maybe. Because the first time we went, my youngest daughter, I was breastfeeding her. Mm -hmm. So that's my youngest daughter. And the next time we went, uh, one of the girls, the middle girl, I think she was about five. So uh, that might have been when this little one was a baby. Mm -hmm. But we had been more than once on our own because we always, my husband always said he knew about them. Mm -hmm. Someday we're going to go see the turkeys in North Carolina because that's where our ancestors came from. Mm -hmm. He knew the whole story about his ancestor because his white uh, great great grandfather started the first he was a Presbyterian missionary and had a, a boarding school in Tennessee oh. came out of Connecticut and places like came down there to uh, enlighten the uh, Cherokees so they had a boarding school for kids there and that's how he got hooked up with the Cherokee. Mm -hmm. He married one. And they came over the Trail of Tears and came here. And of course, right after the Trail of Tears, I say right after, cause it was soon, we had, had, we had just established our area, our ancestors had when the Civil War came. Mm -hmm. So, that was a whole new thing. Right. Um, so you had successfully, um, you were using this, this clay with the, the nice red colors in it, and you had successfully fired um, <coughs> some pipes, and you went to the Hay Foundation in New York, was that uh, after? Well, that happened later. Okay. Uh, when, uh, after I was successful, I entered the Five Tribes shows at okay. the first time. Okay. And uh, Nagofti Scott and some of them, uh, they were doing art and stuff, but uh, we, uh, when I entered my things, they wanted to know what some of the stuff on my pots were. Because you had added some designs already. Yes, what is this design or why did you put those knots on there and things like that. And uh, uh, I entered the first uh, pot that had a spider on it. Mm. And that was the story of how the spider brought us fire. And that had quite a uh, eye-opening thing to the Cherokees. They still use it mm -hmm. in their art, and uh, they wanted to know about the the spider. What did he do, and what what's this about? I said, well, it's just the stories that uh, uh, I can't think of his name now. That that was with the Cherokees long oh. time ago, and he Mooney. wrote a book. Was it Mooney? Mooney? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Mooney had told those stories about all this stuff, because he heard about it and was lived among them and knew about it, and that's the stories that we were told. Mm -hmm. And I have a necklace that's got a shell carving with a serpentine on it, with and the serpentine has wings, mm -hmm. and uh, 
they told us about this when I was a child. The elders would sit around and talk. I remember hearing them tell the story about this huge snake that lived at one time. And my idea was, what if I'd run into that big snake? <laughs> what would I do, you know? I thought it was living today. And, because we'd go uh, berry picking. And, uh, of course, that was a far-fetched idea that I had because I was a child. And, uh, but I'd hear these stories that Mooney had in his book, and perhaps the Cherokees knew them before him mm -hmm. and passed them down. So reading some of that kind of triggered remembrances for you of... Yes, and I also uh, started uh, researching in the archives. I was asked to come to Gilcrease and then later to uh, University of Arkansas. I did a lot. They had a lot of Southeastern things. Mm -hmm. Who invited you to Gilcrease? Well, there was a, uh, I can't think of his last name. He lived at uh, Springdale. He and his wife came one Sunday. He called me. Uh, there was a little spread in the paper about our shows off here. And mm -hmm. He read about me and he called and asked if he and his wife could come out after lunch and stay a little while. I mean, visit a little bit. And little bit was all afternoon <laughs> once they got started. And then he started telling us about things. And he said, we have an enormous amount of uh, information that you could get on the Southeastern stuff uh, at Fayetteville. And you're welcome to come on my invitation, and if somebody tells you you can't, you let me know who it is. <laughs> but that was the kind of invitation we got. And we did go. The only thing they told us when we got ready to come over, please tell them so they could save a parking spot where we wouldn't get hauled away. Yeah. <laughs> and, so we'd always call them. And we went over there many times because we could hold those old pots mm. and I could draw some of those designs. Mm. And you could actually see what it felt like to touch them and how they finished them. And I thought, how could they get these so straight? And, you know, and I uh, started just etching my stuff in my things. Later on, uh, I did different. But at that time, uh, Dr. Hoffman, I can't think of his first name, he and his wife, uh, she was the person that taught how to restore pots, and he was the anthropologist. So he would just say, well, I'm going to open the archives. You can go up. Well, of course, they let us go up the first time. And there was three or four of them sitting there watching us as we came down and brought stuff down, set it on the table to look at it. Then we'd ask them things about it. After a while, when they realized we were serious, they were thrilled to death there was an Indian that was serious about doing this. And I couldn't understand why. <laughs> <laughs> so I learned a lot from them. Yeah, why? And just holding, actually holding those yes. pots and seeing Yes, yes. Uh, we went, he'd say, well, I'm going to open the uh, uh, archives, 
and you just go up and stay as long as you want to. <laughs> I'm going to go teach and I'll be back in such and such a time. But that's the way they treated us over there. Mm -hmm. Then Gilcrease, I was going out southwest. I wanted to see how they fired their pottery. In New Mexico? I yes. Guess. Mm -hmm. And we were going out there and uh, uh, years ago when they were, uh, what did they do with the land when they homestead mm. uh, land way back when uh, some of Robert's family had gone and homesteaded some in New Mexico and uh, there were a lot of states that would let you do that. Uh, the land was free as long as you established a place and so forth. But he already had relatives out there. He was always very curious about them too because he hadn't met some of them. Mm -hmm. So during these trips we did, we visited them and everything and learned about their trip out there and what they had to do. And. Uh, his uncle got out of the uh, military and settled in Albuquerque. So the first time we thought about moving out there, he went out and stayed with his uncle. Then he found out that places that you rented didn't want children. Mm. So there were things like that, you know. Right. And so he said, I don't think it'd be good. And so we didn't move and we stayed here. But during the times I went out to research, uh, Gilcrease anthropologist, I can't think of his name right now, gave me a letter to go to the uh, college where they tested the pottery out there of the peoples out there, oh, uh, uh, pressure point and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. that uh, uh, sent me with a letter and he told me of a family that would be firing if we wanted to go visit them and so forth, and we found that they had used, uh, whereas our family used uh, wood because we were woodland Indians, mm -hmm. they were desert Indians and they used dung, mm -hmm. dried dung, mm -hmm. for their fuel to do pottery. Do you remember if they were, was this in Acoma or? Um, uh, yes, uh, we went to, later we went to all of the uh, Pueblos, visited all of them. Where we went, we went to the museum <laughs> and see what we could find. We found books sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes it was information we didn't know about and all of them were very uh, good about wanting to further your work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I just, and then eventually uh, I, I spoke with the anthropological, uh, archeological and anthropologist group of from Texas and different places mm. and the person who asked me to do that he was so proud that I had stuff in <laughs> the five tribes that he asked me to do that and I was scared to death and he said all you have to do is tell them what you know they don't know it <laughs> They'll be glad to hear about it. So, on that, uh, 
I realized I did know a lot. I could tell them a lot. At one point, I know a lot of times in the research uh, books, I would read where they would find pots that had holes in the bottom. And they, they assumed that they were made uh, because they were uh, ritually broken, you know, mm. to be found or put in that grave. And I said, well, but you know, I think uh, what happened in those cases, I said, where the pots were broken, it's because a potter had a lot of bad luck. <laughs> and, and they would just roar because, you know, to me, it makes sense that they'd have broken pots. <laughs> What's the matter with you, you know, right. that you think it was ritually broken? <laughs> That's what happened. And, uh, you know, we I guess we never really quite discussed it. You, the, you, the first pot you entered at Five Tribes must have created this huge stir. Um, did it? Was it surprising? The first people? pot was a very small pot. As a matter of fact, I think I still have it among my things. Right. It was a little, a uh, couple of little crooked pots, and I went to. I think it was in the early, early seventies. I went to the first Indian market in the malls in in uh, Southwood's Mall. In Tulsa. in Tulsa, okay. And then later we went to the one in Oklahoma City. The Red Earth Festival? No. Oh. It was in the mall. mall. Okay. But anyway, I went to my first one, and they had, uh, uh, I didn't have a booth, but the tribe had a booth, and they said I could, they knew my work by then. Mm -hmm. They said I could put, uh, things on the edge of corner of theirs. Mm -hmm. So I had two little ugly pots and some some pipes. And I lined them up <laughs> there on their corner. But what I did enter for seriousness was my daughter was a first runner up for Miss Cherokee mm -hmm. the first year of her uh, sophomore year mm -hmm. and they said they wanted her in a turkey dress and moccasins <laughs> about a month before it was due. <laughs> so, oh my goodness. <laughs> but I knew what a turkey dress mm -hmm. looked like. Mm -hmm. I didn't like it because it was cloth mm -hmm. and I always knew of my uh, uh, husband's mother described one and it went to Smithsonian of back then. It said they were uh, buckskin and the turkeys had there's a top that came down to the waist and then they had a skirt that came up here and then they had leggings that came up to here. Then they had their moccasins. And that's the vision I had of a turkey mm -hmm. outfit. Mm -hmm. And I thought, even if you had to make it out of cloth, mm -hmm. it should be that, not the way they have them now, mm -hmm. with all those ruffles and mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. and, but I had to follow what what's his name was doing down at Tahlequah. <laughs> so I made my daughter's first uh, runner-up for Miss Chucky dress out of some material. I went shopping for it and everything. I have it here because she left it for me to keep mm -hmm. and I going to give it back to her one of these days and tell her to keep it a while because mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't have the room. But I do have it mm -hmm. and uh, 
a lot of people copied it after mm. that too because I did mine just a little bit different than the rest of them. Mm. When was the first time you made a serious pot? Well, actually, when I first went to the South Rhodes Mall in Tulsa, and uh, actually, I didn't have anything to enter, so they let me place my things on the corner of the turkey crafts. Right. And, uh, but I did have that dress that I entered. And I got, a, uh, not maybe first, but I can't think of that man's name that did those Cherokee dresses down there. It, one of his students got first, and I got a little prize on mine, but there was a lady that came to, to that show, and it was before they invited the Oklahoma uh, what is it they have in Smithsonian every year? Oh, Folk art. Yeah. Uh, but they invited the, I think it was our 75th year or something, that they invited the Oklahoma folk art people. But it was long before that, she came up and she said, uh, who made this? And I was sitting there, and, and I embarrassedly said, I did. And I wanted her to look at the dress. <laughs> it was hanging up there. And she said, who made this? And it was the pipes. I said, I did. <laughs> she just looked. And so she said, uh, now I want to watch you and see what you do from here. I'm going to keep an eye on you. I didn't have any idea who she was. So she went on to the next booth and, and never had met her. And so I went to the, uh, they had a, a luncheon and she was going to be speaker, and so was uh, that guy that won the Olympics. Oh, Jim Thorpe. Or... Yes. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. No. Not him. The young guy. Uh, Everybody knew his yeah, name. Yeah. Uh, was he a skier? I can't remember. Well, anyway, he was also the speaker, and I wanted mm -hmm. to hear him. Mm -hmm. And so I went to this dinner. Uh, and when she got up and started talking, I was very interested in the the Olympic guys talk and want to get his autograph and everything. Yeah. And then when she got up and started talking, she said, "I'm with the Smithsonian Folk Art uh, Organization, and my title is." Uh, her title was uh, Indian Awareness and she traveled through the country and picked out things that would go into this and uh, so uh, it just baffled me who she was you know <laughs> that she was, she was interested in funny. my ugly things <laughs> So uh, it was a couple of years or so later, I saw her at a show in Oklahoma City. And I had some pieces that were much nicer. I had designs. And she bought one of them. And she said, I want to keep watching you and so forth. <laughs> and what uh, was your prices at that point? You yes, that was... Uh, what was her name? I knew her name so well. She was Cherokee. Oh, Claudia Nowuski. Is yes. She married to a commit. Yes. She married a she married a, a Cheyenne. Oh, Cheyenne. She said when she married him, she was telling me when she married him, they called her a white person <laughs> 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 because the 
Cherokees live so much like the white people, <laughs> and they didn't. And uh, but anyway, I knew both of them, and uh, but. Eventually, when she, uh, I had had several shows, and uh, I, uh, of course, she'd seen the dress and all that, but she was still interested in the pottery because there weren't any turkey potters, mm -hmm. and that's why she was interested. And I kept going. Every time we'd go to Cherokee, we had this good friend, Betty Dupree, that was with the, uh, uh, where they had their arts and crafts uh, there, and she bought for them. Mm -hmm. And first time I walked in the door with the pot, she said, what are you going to do with that? I said, I'd like to sell it. She said, well, I want to buy it. So she <laughs> bought my first pot. I had more than one, so she bought pipes and things. And sometimes she'd trade for other crafts. Mm -hmm. All those years, I did that. And I have a basket, double woven basket, right in mm -hmm. there that sits that's from that time. So she was putting your pots in the gift shop back there at Cherokee, North Carolina. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then I have a picture somewhere of their potter, best potter, that I met. And I was supposed to jury their show. Of course, she was good. So I gave her first prize. And I have a picture of her and myself mm. in it. And I think she's still living. Mm -hmm. So in the in the seventies, I guess you went to the Cherokee Tribal Council and you proposed that they help you put together a workshop on pottery. No, uh, I didn't. I didn't ask anybody. They asked me. Okay. And <clears throat> I was doing uh, the J O M. Uh, Indian workshops in the schools up here okay. at Benin. Then uh, Claremore would ask me, Commerce, Miami. So I would make up a calendar. When I ran out of time, I'd say, I can't do any more because I'm full. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. So I'd go to all these places up here. Eventually, I got down into the Cherokee country and wasn't working for the tribe. Mm -hmm. I was working for the school. But what happened in Benita, uh, the person who came out to our house to get the Indians together so they could get the program in the first place was part Cherokee and he was a principal mm -hmm. and he came out to our house. So we got the Indians and we got the program. And you know, for some reason, they got the idea that they could buy uh, buses and school stuff with that money. Mm -hmm. And it definitely said you could not mm -hmm. do that. And I was the only person that was standing up saying, you can't do that. Wow. And uh, I was fighting the system. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize I was by myself. <laughs> and, 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 and so uh, when he visited other places, especially Miami, they were very strong together mm -hmm. as a tribe. Mm -hmm. He didn't say a whole lot about that, but he'd go down to Tahlequah, it seemed down there. He was trying to learn all he could about it. And at the end of school in May, the first of May, I realized we had not even had the kids to 
uh, have all the stuff they should have. Mm. I was just going around with my pottery right, and doing that. They enjoyed it and the teachers enjoyed it. But uh, uh, they got so they would tell the kids, even if you even waved at an Indian, you're Indian, and things like that. And I was fighting all that. Mm, my goodness. So at yeah. the end of the school, I went to the uh, superintendent mm -hmm. and told him that it, this one's supposed to be that way. Mm -hmm. So they had a a uh, public school get together, and they call Washington, and Washington told them the same thing I did. Mm -hmm. They were misusing those J and yes. J O M monies. And they had summer school for the Indian kids to use that money so mm -hmm. they wouldn't lose it. We still have. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the program, right. but it's run the way it's supposed to be run. Right. It Did was not very popular mm -hmm. uh, in public schools. Uh, that is something I know. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, you made a real difference there by yeah. standing up. Did you like? You can leave that out. <laughs> no, I think that's important. Did you like um, teaching? Did you? get restless because you felt like it was taking some time away from your pottery? How did that work out? Did I what? Did you like teaching or did you sometimes uh, feel uh, I need to get I back like to my pots? teaching because the kids were learning a lot. And I would tell them when they asked questions, I would tell them Indian things I knew about our tribe and things and that each tribe was different. And that uh, they'd say, uh, I'd say, what nationality are you? I'm American. I said, I'd say that's not a nationality. Uh, America is is a place where you're from, but where did your family come from? That's your nationality. Mm -hmm. Go back and ask your parents. I don't know where Americans, you know. <laughs> uh, so I did teach them. Mm -hmm. They had another uh, nationality, mm -hmm. and how that worked. That each nationality had its own language, mm -hmm. just like each Indian has its own language. They don't all speak the same. Right. They don't understand each other. So I did tell them a lot of things that I knew mm -hmm. for sure, but I wouldn't say it if it wasn't <laughs> true. So I think it it was good because uh, sometimes uh, the school didn't teach it. Right, so. right. Um, so you did, um, when, you, when Bill Glass co-taught with you, those workshops were for students in the public schools. They weren't for community people. Well, uh, what we did, those boys came up here to ask me mm -hmm. if I would be on that uh, committee. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course I had to speak to my husband because it was an evening thing and so he would go with me. And of course, he had his Indian card too. So, anyhow, uh, they all got acquainted with my husband and knew he was part Cherokee. And uh, we had to go through the council uh, and see if we could have a place. Uh, they wanted us to do something, but we had to have a place. So, we uh, rented for one dollar, I think, this school that used to be an old school, and later they turned it into a community building. So that's where we had our meetings, 
and they told us if we wanted it, we could have it for a dollar a year and fix it up. So that's what we did. Wow. We, we fixed, uh, shined up the floors and did everything we could and used it. And then we rented it to community people for their singing conventions mm -hmm. or whatever. But it was ours and there was a man that lived close to it that was sort of a caretaker. And uh, I think even coon hunters would read it sometimes. <laughs> and they'd rent it for singing conventions and things mm -hmm. like that. So, so we made a little money and um, kept going. But what we did, we worked with the community people mm -hmm that did the arts, all the arts that Cherokees did. We pulled them in and got them on the list and they would come and uh, we would have kind of a school for them uh, to have them to present a program to us so they would know how to sell mm -hmm. when they got out in public. And we'd always tell them, you're the one that makes it, you know how to make it. That's that's what you tell them. And some of them, it was easy, some of them, they'd back out and they wouldn't come back. Mm. <laughs> so it was really partly focused on helping them kind of market yes. and present themselves. And then we worked with the Oaks mm -hmm. boarding school, the kids there. Mm -hmm. We taught them and uh, so. You did do Santa Fe Indian Market. You entered Pottery and Santa uh, Fe Indian Market. Well, Bill and, uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, there's Bill and uh, there's one other guy. They went out there and then they kept telling me, you ought to sign up, but you have to wait uh, because there's a lot of people signing up. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes you can get in. You have to wait your turn. So they kept saying, you ought to sign up and go out there. So I decided <laughs> what, that I would go out there. It was in the early 70s, I think. And uh, I signed up and I didn't get in that first year. And the next year I get in because I was the only traditional Eastern potter. Wow, that and was fast. <laughs> so I put my stuff out there and even some of the uh, Pueblo people would ask me, are you Indian, you know? I said, yes, don't I look like I am, you know? <laughs> and then I'd tell them, yes, I am, I'm Cherokee. And uh, what kind of pots are those? I said, they're Cherokee pots. <laughs> you know, they never seen the designs. Mm -hmm. And they'd say, how did, sometimes they'd say, how did you do this? Mm -hmm. Just to have fun out of them after I've been there about the third year. This lady come up and asked me how I did uh, my corn cob design. And <clears throat> I told her with my teeth. I... <laughs> and she looked at me and I was grinning. She walked away. Then she came back later and talked to me. <laughs> I said, that's a Cherokee design. Um... You made, uh, you got into making stamps um, to use on your work. Um, did I, your collection grow over the years of stamps that you used on your pots? Uh, well, I have them, but when I first started doing them, I told you I just etched them in. Right. And then when I saw that piece at the Hay Foundation, well, in New York. Yes, 
uh, our group, the Cherokee Art Association, was invited as a tribe to send our arts up there. Even Willard Stone, we asked him, mm -hmm. and he sent one of his art pieces up there. And uh, people that made uh, uh, the spear, uh, what is it? that you spear fish with. Mm, yeah. Uh, there's a name for them in yeah. Turkey. But anyway, uh, there was a man that made those. And we sent some of those up there that he had made. The public had never seen things like that wow. before. They made a big hit because they were Cherokee and people came there and saw that stuff and they didn't realize. Cherokees still did think like that. But this man, Giggs, okay. uh, was what they used to do. And uh, my family used to, the men used to go out in the night and have a light and mm -hmm. the fish would come up and they would spear those fish mm -hmm. and get the big fish. And uh, uh, we had the, like the shell carvings and anything in baskets, whatever we had, whatever I had. I had some baskets that I had bought from uh, Ella Mae Black Bear who is mm -hmm. gone now. And I had bought some from her. I sent those up there as her uh, representative of her work. Mm. And whatever the boys could get out here, we told them that they would be back, you know, that they'd take care of them and send them back. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they went around collecting everything they could and sent it. And up here where there was people that had collected things, I collected those and shipped it. And nobody paid me for the shipping, but <laughs> we did those things. Right, right. And was this in the 80s, mid 80s? Or? No, I think it was more in the 70s. Late 70s. And, uh, but they showed there mm -hmm. and, uh, and eventually, I don't know what happened, uh, what the, the Cherokee said, we couldn't have the building anymore or mm -hmm. what, mm -hmm. but uh, we had to quit doing that. Mm -hmm. So we had a big list of people on those uh, sheets mm -hmm. and uh, some of them are gone now and uh, the things that they did whether it was jewelry or what mm -hmm. and uh, basketry so I do have a collection of baskets and but that was a good thing mm -hmm. for for that tribe. Cherokee. Then they build up their uh, Cherokee holiday show with people that could do things like that. Right. Then uh, in the 80s, uh, Wilma Man Keller started the Living Treasures right. of the older people. What has that meant to you to be? You have that title. Well, uh, it, well, I was surprised because I was the first woman. Okay. And then uh, when we were inducted, there was me and another man and then two that had died. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that did things. And from then on, they had people that would do different things. 
and they might be related to the older people. Mm -hmm. Well, you also have, there's like a bronze sculpture bust of you <laughs> at Northeastern State University. Well, that happened in the 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, Jane Austen, uh, who was one I of your students, <laughs> became acquainted because she was a pottery student at NSU. And I was hired by the Cherokees to come to the village and out in that uh, place where they would go and have programs. Right. And I had a, a stand where I was demonstrating my work. And I remember uh, that uh, Jane and one of her friends that was in school came over and they asked if they could watch me. I said, yes, that's what I'm here for. Even tourists that came through, you know, could watch me and learn. So it wasn't very long after that, that Jane came back and she said, I want to do that. I want to do what you're doing. And meaning that she want, she was doing wheel throwing. Right. But I also knew she was a painting artist. Mm. And uh, then uh, she came up to my house one day, she was writing her paper, her uh, thesis for the college, and she did an interview and she asked me if I had a shawl. I said, yes, I do. She said, would you put it on and go out here and I want to take a picture of you. And so I put it on and went out there. And lo and behold, a few months later, I, went, uh, I was called to come down there to do a workshop. Then I was called to the college uh, art department. And the teacher came about her there. He said, I know you. I had no idea what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went down to the basement where the art department was. There was Jane with this wax sculpture of me, a bust of, I mean, and she had designs all over the shawl. Mm. And it was, uh, she told me, she said, this is uh, 150 years since the removal, mm. and you represent the women on the Trail of Tears. Mm. <laughs> uh, you had no idea you were no, going to No, it just turn. blew my mind. <laughs> and, and later on, the college wanted to have it bronzed. Mm -hmm and the tribe wanted to have it bronze. Neither one of them could afford it, so they went together mm. and had it bronze. And it sits in the Bacon uh, Indian Studies building, mm -hmm. it's just off campus. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, things that's happened to me, I just couldn't fathom anything. From that, that journey from, from those that little, little pipes. <laughs> yeah, from the pipe. And that's what started because I wasn't a part. Right. And I have a, a painting that a local artist did of me, a full one in the bedroom, that she did that before. Not that, but she did one before that was put out in Tulsa and she had prints made and I, she gave me prints for each one of my kids and then there was one that hangs in the restaurant down there mm. and but it was just this far up and after we had the unveiling of the bronze she and some of the Bonita people came to that and that is what came out of it. 
Hmm. She told me afterwards, she said, I want to paint you just like you are tonight. <laughs> because of the way we, uh, uh, my, for some reason, uh, Jane and I both picked a black dress to wear that night. <laughs> <laughs> she had on a black dress and I had on a black dress. And mine has quite a story. Uh, my daughter and her husband were in Thailand uh, working with the Thai people over there and uh, of course she would, had access to getting silk very, uh, you know, she asked me if I needed any because I sewed a lot. Right. I said, yes, I'd like to have some black and some blue. And I don't know why I told her, just send me a yard of blue. But that uh, outfit in there is what I made out of that. And their yardage was only 36 inches wide. So she sent me enough to have something made. So I got that out and I cut it up and made a dress and wore it. <laughs> to that's the, what you wore? Yeah. Aww. And I made a, uh, they were wearing cummerbunds at that time. They were stylish. So I made a cummerbund out of finger woven oh. belt. Yes. And uh, then I put it on black so it would yeah. show up. Yeah. And she said, I want to paint you just like you are tonight. <laughs> and that's what she did. Well, we're going to look at a few of your pots in a minute, but you know, looking back over your career, what do you think was one of the most decisive kind of forks in your life? When you, what was what? I, one of the more decisive like forks in your life when you decided to go a certain way that... Uh, with my poverty? Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I never did change uh, the idea. My idea for my pots was to create them in the shape that I found those that I saw, mm -hmm. the old ones, and not veer away from those shapes. But I could do anything I wanted to with those designs. When I found a design, I could just repeat it around the pot. It could be up here, or it could be in the middle, or whatever. I had uh, an anthropologist and an archaeologist came together to my booth at Santa Fe. They said, what tribe are you? I said, I'm a Cherokee. He said, is this Cherokee pottery? And they being who they were, they looked at them and they said, I never did see a jerky pot with designs around it like that. I said, you have now, because <laughs> I'm Cherokee. Mm -hmm. And so I used the designs any way I wanted to, because I wanted them to get out. Mm -hmm. I wanted our people to know what was there and I put them on a pot, even if they were off of a shell carving. Mm -hmm. I found a, a, a design. I put it on a pot. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times they were on pots. And uh, so I won a big prize uh, one year with one that had just a bunch of snakes swimming, only they were, the top ones had wings, and these and the water were just going around the pot. It was a pretty big pot, and it got a good price, at, uh, and I don't even remember who bought it. Uh, I'll just have to tell you this story. Uh, my children lived in Hawaii, 
after they came back from Thailand. And they uh, had their first child over there. Uh, Betty and Bennett, and his last name was Parnes. And uh, we went over there four of their eight years, mm -hmm. simply because my husband didn't like to fly. <laughs> <laughs> he said, we'll go over there this year, but we won't go the next year. So we did that, and I'm glad we did, because that's a special time. We learned other things from the natives over there, mm. because they knew some of the natives, the families. And, uh, but, uh, I was going to tell you something about about that. Related to the pot with the snake designs? Uh, well, I think what I did, you'll never see in any other pots of the mm -hmm. old, mm -hmm. because I decided to do my designs anywhere mm -hmm. I wanted to. Mm -hmm. And effigy pots were also a big part of what you did, yes. weren't they? Yes, uh, I did some of those, but not as much as uh, sculpturally as my daughter does. Mm -hmm. She does like little nativity scenes and things like that. She's gone into something uh, in pottery. She's uh, stayed with some traditional. She does something that my husband didn't ever like for me to do and didn't want me to do. It's those head pots. Oh, You've seen those yes, head pots. Yes, yes, yes. And what I wanted to see in those head pots was the the way they wore their hairdos. Yes. And I wanted to copy those. So I copied them on drawing. Mm -hmm. I did those. Uh, to an early extent, I went to the five tribes I entered uh, at that early time. Uh, I entered a, a piece that was called the uh, Spiral Man. Mm -hmm. And he was, his hairdress was like that. And what he wore, jewelry he wore. That's what I wanted. So I decided to do it that way instead of the head pots. And uh, I made one mask, and my daughter still got that. And I just did it because I was looking at a head pot. And uh, the uh, the uh, exciting thing that happened out of this was the fact that we went back to my uh, Smithsonian lady. And I had just had surgery in Tulsa and was, uh, was uh, convalescing. And she called me and she interviewed me for a trip to the Smithsonian. Oh, how and <laughs> I said, "Do you think I'll be ready to go?" And it was the first of June through the. We were up there two weeks, <laughs> and she said, "Oh yes, I think you'll be able to do this. All you have to do is talk to people that come up to you, and you're demonstrating and so forth." I didn't realize it's going to be thousands and thousands of people. <laughs> oh. <sighs> but that was very exciting to me. Yes. So it came out of the little pots. Yeah. Well, is, is there anything else you'd like to add? And if not, we'll start to take a look at those pots. <laughs> uh, no, I think uh, all the exciting things have Oh, there is one more thing. 
Uh, back in the 80s, uh, we had a minister at uh, Guthrie, a Presbyterian minister, and they were both ministers, the woman and the man. And uh, my daughter was acquainted with them. And I just loved them both and got acquainted with them. And all. She wanted me to come over and give programs and so forth. But out of that one year, she asked me and some other Indian artists to, could she ask those people that say, Anna Mitchell would like for you to do so-and-so, or Bill Glass would like for you to do so-and-so. You know, mm -hmm. uh, like that. Invite your friends to send some uh, pieces to the Peace Museum in East Berlin. Oh. Because it was a little bit before the wall came down mm -hmm. over there. Mm -hmm. And one of her relatives that had come out of uh, to West Berlin because of the war, because Hitler didn't like uh, Christianity or anything good. He wanted to kill everything. So they had come out of there, and she had two. And, uh, but her cousin was a minister. He took his young uh, ministerial students over where they had bombed and shattered the, uh, the uh, cathedral over there. And near the cathedral was a Jewish man's place, a store. And of course, uh, they decided to make the little museum, peace museum, in his little building. Mm -hmm. They fixed it up, and <coughs> and they asked us to send our pieces up there. She asked me if I would make a pot for that. And she, they, uh, they had a, a little dedication at Christmas time in Oklahoma City. And I asked some people if they would, and some of them did, and some of them didn't. And there was another man, there was a man that sent the peace pipes that he had made. And uh, we wrote a little thing about our work, and that was from the Native Americans of America and their share of peacemaking. So they hand delivered them over there. Mm -hmm. And about two months later, they started tearing the wall down. Not because of that, but of course we said it was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's but I have uh, her cousin has been to my place, has been to my, w w came to our place and helped us fire. And uh, he knew they love Indian art, the Germans do. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he took pictures of that museum and took pictures of my pot in there. And he wrote all the story about that museum, typewritten. And then she added the letter she'd sent out. I have all those. Oh, that's really neat. <laughs> in some of my packing. I hope a rat didn't get in there. <laughs> Well, great. Well, let's uh, take a look at some of your work now. That's beautiful. That uh, is an eagle motif or warrior motif? It's a falcon. Falcon, yeah. Uh, this is what I was saying about
putting the patterns where I wanted them. Mm. And that way you can have a shot of what that falcon looked like. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I would draw him with his wings out, all out. Mm -hmm. And I would look at a eagle's uh, picture mm -hmm. of an eagle. Uh, it spread its wings out like it was. Mm. And then it had these little crosshatch markings mm -hmm. uh, on people's faces mm -hmm. and on birds and sometimes on other animals. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, that seemed like it was a very important and I know that the Cherokees have a uh, ritual about the eagle. There has to be a certain person that can get the eagle mm -hmm. and a certain people handle it and all that kind of thing mm -hmm. for a ceremonial. Mm -hmm. But this is the largest pot I have here. Mm -hmm. And the only reason I have it is because it had a small crack over here in the neck. Mm -hmm. It's one of my early ones because I didn't realize you were supposed to grab the necks when you were polishing. Uh. And when I would fire them, it'd have those little cracks. So I had to learn not to do that. Mm, you have to hold them like you're holding a baby. A baby, it's beautiful. This is a dark one. And it's got <coughs> a kind of swirly design mm -hmm. that I took after a uh, melon, you know. Yes. And later on, then I did this little other design around it. Mm. I did this early. Beautiful. And 204. Mm -hmm. And it's been in uh, Washington until this year. Oh. And she had this letter in it and and it tells what she, what price she had on it. Uh-huh. And so forth. That's beautiful. And, and so But burning. every year she bought pottery from me at Santa Fe mm. for the Department of Interior. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, the one thing that I found when you do a show uh, you sell directly to the buyer, you get your money instantly. Right. And you don't have to wait two weeks or a right. month or whatever, according to somebody else's plan. Right. You just, they come around and they buy. Now, uh, with her, uh, I never sold to a museum or a gallery because I learned long ago that they take, they want half. Mm -hmm. And I could kind of dicker with the others and mm -hmm. tell them, if you buy several, you can have a certain percent off. Mm -hmm. So that's the way with her. Uh -huh. She had a certain percent off and she bought. And she would buy outright. Than, yeah, nice. more than one every year. Yeah. So. That was good. <laughs> so that was one thing. And then this is a, a little canoe that yeah. uh, my daughter made and it was, mm. she made it for my uh, card holder. Yeah, lovely. And uh, <laughs> it's out of our play too. <laughs> then they hand you. I'll have to tell you about this. I was in Santa Fe uh, and we went up to uh, a place where they had people from Mexico oh. and uh, Oaxaca. Uh -huh. And this woman had black clay and oh. she gave me enough to make a pot, which was this pot. Wow. And I told Robert coming home, I said, this is not gonna fire out black. He said, 
why, why do you think it's not? Because it's black, black clay. I said, it'll fire out light color. I said, when you fire it and smother your firing is when you get black pots. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I made this in 19... Oh, four, I think. 1994. 1994. How neat. What a neat story behind that. So, <laughs> anyway, it did turn light. Yes. <laughs> and in this one, I made this design many times, and I found this idea in the <clears throat> Southeast Coast pottery. Hmm. And these represent, to me, they represent the ocean waves, how they come. Yeah. And, they and it makes two of them, one going this way, ah. one going that way. So I would always put it on a pot like this in four directions because it was a very uh, important thing that our tribe did. And this is slip darker, and I was working on this pot mm. when I had my stroke, and so my daughter went out there and she fired this pot for me oh. so that I could have it. I told her I wasn't through with it. <laughs> and I, said, oh. I said, I want to paint this again so it would, it would be smooth and show those. Yeah. She said, yes, but you weren't able to, so I did it. <laughs> so I'm glad that one of my children, and I think Here. that my, my daughter, youngest daughter, would have been a potter had she had the time. Mm -hmm. but her boys came and stayed with us when they were little. Uh -huh. And they each made a pot, and they made a pretty good sized pot. One of them copied my designs exactly. Wow, wow. And <laughs> the other one went his own way. And it looked like he was drawing petroglyphic designs. Wow, that's interesting. Because uh, <laughs> these little stick people were in certain angles and stuff, I said, oh, you drew petroglyphs. <laughs> he said, I don't know what that is, but these are people in chaos because of the world mm. is in chaos. Mm. <laughs> he said, that's, that's why they're acting like that. <laughs> he had a bigger idea than I did. <laughs> well, Anna, thank you so much for your time today. It's been You're welcome. <laughs>